Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, before we do get started, I do want to let you know that the program is brought to you in part by the financial support of our listeners. And I particularly want to thank Jacqueline so much for her support. Uh, we will send uh, access to our premium site, which we do with all donations of $7 or more. You can support the show on a one-time basis at support.greatdetectives.net. And you can also become an ongoing monthly supporter of the program uh, for as little as $2 a month at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for today's episode of The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. The original air date, July the 5th, 1950. And it's the girl from Pitchfork Corners. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment. Presents for your listening enjoyment, Raymond Chandler's most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. Here's a taste treat you can enjoy indoors, outdoors, at work or at play. The cool, long-lasting mint flavor refreshes you. The smooth, steady chewing helps keep you fresh and alert. Adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Now with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, the makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum are glad to bring you tonight's exciting story, The Girl from Pitchfork Corners. <laughs> I'm sure what I'm saying, what I'm saying. Do I do I look like I'm wearing, wearing blinkers? Now, for the third and last time, so I can go back to marking his form. Nobody's been in that seat, mister, since we left L.A. Nobody, nobody. You sure you got the right stall? Yeah, yeah. Car J, lower 12. Your J, upper 12, right? Right, 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 like rain, like rain. Well, that's life for you. Now, look, friend, you. friend, let's go around again. Huh? His name is Latimer, Arnold Latimer. I don't know what he looks like, but he's supposed to be heading for San Francisco. Now, maybe you heard somebody call him, page him, something. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Nobody called no one except that pool cue conductor with the brass buttons and the sandpaper voice. Uh, you checked him? You checked him? Yeah, twice, twice. Now, look, lower 12 is vacant as far as he's concerned, right? And no Arnold Lattimore in the club car or the diner either? Hey, now, wait a minute. Have you tried the washroom? Yeah, same story. Ah, uh, well... Well, looks like your entry was scratched, has scratched. Uh Uh-huh. Also looks like Glendale is where I get off. So long, pal. Good luck with the ponies. Hey, now, hold it, hold it. Don't tell me that Latimer bird is the only reason you're on this train. One and only. Look, if you run across a pony called Not On Hand, play it heavy, huh? Yeah, sure. But not Not the show. show. Not the show. Not Not the the show. show. Good night, friend. I waited on the platform at Glendale until the chrome streamliner had glided out with car J, lower 12, still empty. Then I got a cab back to Union Station in L.A., picked up my own car and headed for 1312 North Bronson Drive in Hollywood and a woman I'd never seen named Donna Rollins. She had hired me by special delivery letter that afternoon, crisp $50 bill enclosed therein, to be sure that one Arnold Latimer was going where he'd said he was going. That had been my job. Well, the place on Bronson was the kind of imitation Mount Vernon architecture where Washington couldn't have slept a wink. The lady that answered the door was about as colonial as Bebop. Yet she was a full lap behind the other extreme known as glamorous Hollywood type. Just a nice-looking anybody. With freckles, brown hair, and a soft bun, and dressed in a white blouse that didn't plunge an inch. Yes? What is it? Oh, I'm Philip Marlowe, Miss Rollins. I'm afraid you're entitled to some change. Uh, may I come in? Change? What do you mean, change? Your $50. (laughs) It's a lot of money for a one-line report on a little man who wasn't there. Uh, uh, 
Miss Rollins, did you hear me? Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Marlowe. I, um, I don't like to seem abrupt, but I'm very busy. Excuse me, please. You seem to have lost interest in Mr. Latimer in a hurry. You know, when you sent me the letter this uh, please, afternoon... Please, Mr. Marlowe, there isn't time for talk. I've already told you I'm very busy. Good night. Okay, baby. Good night it is. I backed my nose off the front door knocker, chalked down to Rollins' office, another woman who had changed her jittery mind, and walked a dozen yards back to where I'd parked my car. The crisp $50 bill was still burning a hole in my pocket. When I was in behind the wheel, I was still worried about taking so much for so little until I flicked my headlights on and the slash of white picked up something I hadn't expected. Donna Rollins, a coat thrown over her arm, a face stamped with fear, was running away from the house like it was going to blow up, headed for a taxi cab parked close to a corner. I started my car to follow her, but I never made it because a hot rod decided all at once to park in front of me. The adolescent climbed over his door and came toward me. He was strictly brash high school sophomore with dialogue to match. Of course, the cab was gone. Well, Pappy, nice going. Your bumpers pleated my twin pipes. Well, what do you calculate doing about it? If you were five years older and five inches taller, I'd pleat you, Pappy. Now, come here. Oh, hey, let me go. Not until I speak my piece. You, Sonny, you're going to get those two cars apart in less than two minutes because I don't calculate on being gone any longer. Is that crystal clear? Yeah, yeah, sure, mister. Sure, I'll fix it up double quick. You'll see. I practically got it done now. Okay? I don't know. We'll talk about it again in two minutes. I had no idea what Donna Rollins had been running to or from. But the fact that she was gone while her front door was still open made her house the first place to check. I found the living room nothing more or less than I'd seen at my first peek. Plush, but empty. The bedroom beyond was the same. White satin drapes spilling onto a wall-to-wall jet black hook rug and... On the far side of the room, sprawled over an also white ottoman. A very beautiful blonde girl. Very dead. She'd been shot twice in the back sometime in the last hour. There was no identification in any of the pockets of the expensively tailored gabardine suit that she wore. In a handbag, the story was the same. Yeah, it looked like Donna had had good reason to run, but that I had a better one for calling the police. Or taking her messages. Hello? I want to talk to Donna. She isn't in, message? Yeah, she has a message. I want you to find her and get it to me, please. Hey! Hey, I can't hear you. Are you still there? Yeah. Now, hold on. Oh. His phone booth leaked. Okay. Who are you? Friend of Donna's. You said you had a message. Yeah, so I did. But? But I think you're awful anxious, fella. Too anxious. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't get touchy. I'm a friend, all right. Skip it. Friend. Ah. Not a chance, Junior. Nevins, one, two, one, two. We may get together yet. Los Angeles City Building. Fire uh, department. Battalion Chief Kegler, please. One moment, sir. All right. Battalion Chief. Phil Marlowe, King. Oh, hi, Phil. Look, can you get me some dope in a big hurry? It's important. Oh, sure, Phil. Name it. What firehouse went out on a call less than a minute ago? Can you look it up? Well, I don't have to. It's here on the board in front of me. Um, Engine Company 5, Phil, San Fernando Valley. But it's only a small I don't fire. care about that, Keg. Where does Engine Company 5 live? Where in the valley? Can you give me that? Well, I think so, Phil. <laughs> Seeing it was me own outfit for 14 years. The corner of Ventura Boulevard and Whitsitt. But, Phil, what do you I'll want to... I'll call you later, Chief. We'll talk it over then, huh? Thanks. Goodbye. I was playing a long shot. But any kind of a lead on a deep freeze voice who had a message for a girl who left her corpse in her bedroom was worth checking. So for the time being, I skipped calling the police and left the place lights out, door closed but not locked. Then I found my car where the hot rod pilot had left it. Started for the San Fernando Valley in the firehouse called Five. Twenty minutes later, when I was there and out of my car, I came face to face with my second break. The only payphone within a half block of the engine company was at an all-night open-air hot dog stand. And the attendant on hand, a girl with a kind of arched eyebrows that left her looking constantly surprised, had an A1 memory. 
I most certainly do remember the party you're talking of, mister, most certainly. And for two especially good reasons. Like what, honey? Like top and bottom, hair and shoes are referred to. Oh. The former, red, like this ketchup here. And the latter, suede and yellow, no less. And hey, he was Bessie. the... Yeah, excuse me. Yes, sure. Well, let's be quick. Hot dog, Bessie. You pick it with your own dainty fingers. Yeah, with my own dainty fingers. Really, Chris, you say the same thing every night. It gets to be very... Bessie. Old-packed. Bessie, uh, pardon me, dear, but this counts. Do you know who this redhead in yellow suede shoes is? His name? Oh, no, I never saw him before. Oh, fine. Well, thanks, baby. Oh, don't mention it. Uh, by the by, I do know where he went, if that means anything. Baby, it means a lot. Where? Tell me. With the old Mexico club here in Studio City. He works there or something. Anyhow, I know he made a call to Herbert Ring, the gambling big shot, and called him boy. And Ring runs that place. Thanks, sweetheart. Here's ten for your trouble. Buy Chris a new old hat. Thanks. Goodbye. The old Mexico club was phony south of the border. From authentic Latin American rumba team, I'd seen billed as Mr. and Mrs. Buck and Wing a month ago at the policeman's ball. To a life-size painting of a bullfighter who had his cape thrown over the wrong shoulder. <laughs> was strictly second-rate all the way down and back up the line to the proprietor himself, Herbert Ring. An almost smooth, almost big bookmaker whom I knew slightly. I found him at a corner table huddled over a glass of milk, listening hard to none other than the redhead with the gaily colored feet. When I stepped up to them, the conversation broke off sharply. Well, well, well. Hi, Phil. What's new, boy? Oh, nothing much, Herb. Outside of a job I just landed. A girl named Donna Rollins. Donna Rollins? Quiet, Larry. Uh, excuse us, uh, won't you? Sit down, Phil, sit down. Uh, Mr. Marlowe, uh, uh, Larry. How are you? I'll be at the bar, boy. <laughs> He's not so friendly, Phil. The uh, evasive type, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Evasive like uh, Arnold Latimer, maybe? Arnold Latimer. Who's that, Phil? Now, listen, Herb, I'm trying it straight. Donna Rollins and you, what's the tie? I forget. Your angle? Right now, curiosity and a corpse, no more. Oh, somebody's dead, huh? Where? I forget. <laughs> Round two, Herbie. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Phil, you got as much good sense as you have nerve. Thanks. I'll try it straight for a while. Mm. A certain party has me over the barrel. Tonight's the payoff. I plan on making it. That's all. Blackmail? And you're almost happy about it? Ho oh, ho. Now look, Herb, you Marlo, don't expect me. You're thinking like an honest man. Now turn it over. Huh? I'm stuck, so I pay. Once. Blackmail's your name for it. We call it smart money. And smart money's what we deal in. You follow? Almost. But this certain party, is it Donna Rollins? Marlowe, after what I said about your good sense. Oh, yeah. How straight can you get, huh? <laughs> Leave it alone, Phil. Good night, boy. I watched them go as far as the bar and pass Larry, who quietly fell in step behind without so much as the command heel. And when they both disappeared into a door marked private, I decided I'd had enough of old Mexico. <laughs> to my car and pointed it back to Donna Rollins' place for the only reason left. I didn't know where else to go. Half hour later when I was there, I was glad it had played that way because number 1312 North Bronson was not dark as I'd left it, but lights on, front door, wide open, radio going, and for a topper, a gentleman of maybe 35, in tweeds and a sunburn, mixing himself a drink. The evening paper open on a nearby coffee table. What? Good evening. Oh, you startled me. You, you uh, a friend of Donna's? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> she in? No, she... Say, who are you? You barge in here, close the door, make yourself... I told you, I'm a friend of Donna's. Oh, that's odd. So am I. A study boyfriend. Shall we try again? All right, the name's Marlowe. I'm a private detective working for Donna. A pri... Oh, Donna hired a private detective? Why? What's wrong? Take it easy, Uh, Mr... Uh, Uh, Sattler, Doug Sattler. Now, please, now, Mr. Marlowe, come to the point. I had a date with Donna. Yeah, well, from the way she left here, I don't think she's going to keep it. Why not? Why shouldn't she? Well, for one thing, if you don't know already, there's a body in the bedroom there. But somebody's dead in there? Yeah, very dead. Mm -hmm. Let's have a look, huh? Maybe somebody you can identify. 
It's a woman, Mr. Sadler, a blonde. She was shot. Well, who is it, Sadler? Friend of Donna? Oh. It's Donna. <laughs> To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you keep going at your best. So for real chewing enjoyment that's refreshing and long-lasting, always keep Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. Healthful, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Gum will make every day more enjoyable. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's exciting story, The Girl from Pitchfork Corners. The thing in the bedroom was no prettier than it had been when I first found it, only now it had a name. Donna. Donna Rollins, my client. And as Doug Sattler stared at it and repeated the name, his long hands began to twist each other and its forehead got sticky. I finally took him by the shoulder and turned him around away from it. His glistening gray eyes avoided me and instead darted at the corners of the room frantically like a pair of scared mice looking for a place to hide. Donna dead like that? I... I just can't get it through my head. Why? Why? Well, let's try the easy ones first. Like who, huh? You mean you know who did this? Yeah, it's not exactly the handcuff stage, Sattler, but I got a prospect... Come on, let's go in the other room. You can probably use a brace. Yeah, thanks. I need a drink. Yeah, I think it's a girl, a cute one with dark eyes and a double row of freckles across her nose. Freckles? Yeah. Also, she has brown hair and a bun and a mouth that probably liked to smile once. I wasn't doing much of that when I reported to her tonight. You reported to her. Now, wait a minute. That's impossible, Marlo. Why? She was right here in the apartment. Furthermore, she said she was Donna Rollins. I can't understand this, any of it. Hey, wait a minute. Take it easy with that stuff. I said a brace, not a bottle. I need it. You see, I know the girl you've just described. Hmm? Her name's Beverly Cheskin. Cheskin? And a reason for killing, if she didn't? Jealousy. Maybe you better draw me a picture. She's a crazy, unreasonable kid from the sticks, Marlowe. From Pitchfork Corners, Kansas. From where? That's right, Pitchfork Corners. Oh. And the rest of it's just as fantastic. Well, what's the rest of the story? Last summer, my car broke down. I was stuck there for a week. Mm -hmm. She worked in the only drugstore in town. I was just about the first guy she'd ever seen in something beside a straw hat and overalls. She fell for me, and, well, I kind of let her on. You know how a fellow will. I should. I've been hearing the same story since I was in the third grade. It's the truth. Oh, sure, sure. The rest of it, no doubt, goes right down the same cob. From sweet nothings to love letters sealed with a kiss. You finally got around to breaking it to her gently about Donna. She wouldn't believe you, and before you knew it, she dropped everything and came to the big city, huh? Yeah, two days ago. Yeah. You make it all sound pretty silly. It's no sillier to me than that corpse in there. Okay. It's hard to believe she'd actually commit a murder, Marlo. She does have a temper. And she's just pulled her life out by the roots. And you know what? They grow deep in places like Pitchfork Corner City. Boy, didn't you care? Of course I did. Crazy little fool. I, I tried to reason with her in my letters, Never mind, you... never mind. Let's get on to the sophisticated part, huh? About Donna and one Mr. Latimer, for instance. Latimer? Who's that? Oh. How about Donna and Herbert Ring? I don't know any Herbert Ring, either. Mm -hmm. But Donna had a lot of business friends I didn't bother with. Why? Oh, you should have. Doing business with Herb Ring means... Means what? That you have to be fast on your feet. What's <clears throat> that? What'd you pick up off the floor, Marla? An old envelope. I'm a sticker for neatness. Where's Beverly staying, Sadler? I don't know. She called me once, but she wouldn't tell me. I haven't seen her. Where'd she reach you? My hotel, the Greenwood Arms. Mm -hmm. Marlowe, what are we going to do? About Beverly, I mean. Right now, I'm going to try to find her. If you can stand it, Sadler, stay here. And stay sober. <laughs> the crumpled envelope I'd found that didn't belong on Donna's floor had come from the Sunflower Motor Court. Qualified as a lead only because the name might appeal to a sentimental Kansan a long way from home. 
Well, it took the night man at the place five fumbling minutes to discover that Beverly Cheskin actually was registered. Five more to remember that she'd got a call just before I showed up. Had left in a big hurry and had crossed the street towards Sam's, which was a U-drive car lot done in tired green. So was Sam. Uh, sorry, Sonny, but you're out of luck. Ain't a buggy left on a lot. Them two out there laid up. I don't want a car, Sam. I got my own across the street. I'm looking for a girl. Uh, what you doing it in here for? Because her name is Beverly Cheskin. Beverly? Well, say now, ain't this a coincidence? Is it? Uh, pretty little thing by that name we just seen. Freckles and all. Hmm. <laughs> Don't see freckles out here much. Made me kind of homesick. Yeah, I'll bet. Did she rent a car from you? Oh, sure did. Brand new Nash, last one. Oh? Darn near didn't give it to her. She mighty keyed up, you see. Figured the L.A. traffic had put the wild on her till I found out it was love. Love? What do you mean? Why, she asked me what was the shortest way up to Vista Point. <laughs> Won't you get it, son? I'll be very honest, not yet, no. Well, Vista's Mexican for view, oh. senor. <laughs> uh, points just a hoot and holler east of the observatory. See the whole darn valley in all of L.A. I'm up there. Oh, that's where she's headed, huh? You sure? Well, I reckon. Most romantical spot around. Dangerous road, though, more ways than one. But you ain't kidding me. I let you know all about it. Well, not all, but I'm willing to find out. Thanks, Sammy. Not huh, Troy. Don't break your neck across the street, son, as you wait. Leave that heap right where it's set, Thomas. We won't be needing it. I won't take your word for it, Larry. You better. Mr. Ring wants you and me to have a nice talk. Tell him we have nothing in common. He knows different. The name Arnold Latimer, for instance. Sorry, some other time I got a date. Come hey. here, you. Said we're going to talk, Mr. Cool Cucumber. If I have to warm you up to it the hard way, it's okay with me. You know, Larry, there's something wrong with a guy who'll wear yellow suede shoes like those. He must be slow in his reflexes. <laughs> Imagine I'll be seeing you. As I headed for Vista Point, two ugly facts stood out clearly. First, the only person Beverly Cheskin would rush off to Vista Point for was Doug Sattler. Second, he had to be a liar because he called her just as soon as my back was turned. And they both added up to the same thing, another corpse. The road up from the valley floor was a narrow strip of crumbling concrete as full of twists as a hurt worm. But near the top, it leveled off in a series of ragged terraces, grossly overrated as a lover's rendezvous. I pulled off the road, hit my car near a scrub oak, and went the rest of the way up on foot. A cold wind lashed at the manzanita as I worked my way up to the crest. The half moon played unpredictable tag with low clouds. So I followed the shadow of the stone wall out onto the jutting point where the mountain fell away on three sides into a black gorge. Finally, I spotted them. Doug Sattler and the freckled kid from Pitchfork Corners, Beverly, standing I close together fear, but you at the edge of oblivion. Of I was in love with you, Doug. I still am. Doesn't my being here prove that? When, when you called me at the motel, I came up here as fast as I could, even though I knew what you'd done. Oh, Doug, why did you have to kill her? Why? Because she double-crossed me on a business deal. A blackmail deal, Beverly. Blackmail? That's right. Donna knew plenty about certain men in this town, big-timers who'd pay thousands or kill to keep others from finding out about them. Oh, Doug, how could you? Well, it was risky. I had to pose as somebody who didn't exist, a Mr. Arnold Latimer, and pretend that he was the one who had all the information. I demanded 50 grand from a guy named Ring and set Don up as the go-between. Then, as Latimer, I was supposed to go to San Francisco on the train and wait for Donna to come with the money. But I'd have waited the rest of my life. She intended to keep it all for herself. But you killed her, Doug. Was it that important to you? You still don't get it, do you? I know now that there's no chance for us, for you and me. No chance at all, ever. I'm going through with the deal alone, Beverly. I'm going to get that money. But I've got to do something else first. I've heard enough. You don't really think I reached I got for my 38 and edged along the wall toward them, them to where I knew I couldn't well, miss. I made a mistake, Beverly. I dropped an envelope in Donna's place and Marlowe found it. He knows I lied, but I can still say I did it to protect you. Protect me? 
What, what do you mean? He'll Just... be up here eventually, but all he's going to find is a stupid kid from Pitchfork Corners who murdered a rival in a fit of jealousy and then couldn't face it. And came I was counting on the wind to cover any noise, and it did. You see, it was a... That's why I was caught flat-footed. When the shock came. Sat lurched up on his toes and doubled over, clawing at his stomach. I crouched down as Herbert Ring stepped out of the brush across the clearing, a thin barrel gun in his hand. Don't move, sister. <laughs> Sat had fallen face down on the ground. I started moving again as Ring rolled him over with his foot. He was dead. That's the only payoff Mr. Arnold Latimer gets for me. It's too bad you had to be here to see it made, sister, because I can't afford a witness. I'm sorry, I really am. But it's no worse than he was going to do to you. Ring! Duck Beverly! <laughs> Let that gun lay, Ring. Don't reach for it. Just for a lax. That Larry, that louse. He was supposed to... Yeah, it's a little late for tips, Herb. You should have hired a better class of help. Uh, go fry your head. Nobody's perfect. Even you. Yeah, where'd I slip? Too much volume when I talk to Sam? Yeah, that's right, Bob. Bob. I tagged you there and listened. So you knew where to come and you heard the rest of it up here just like I did. <laughs> You take it, Herb. It's not going to be easy getting him down this hill to a dock. Are you kidding, Shamus? I ain't moving any place. If, if you know any pretty words, go say them to the lady. She's the one who needs them. They'll go over big in... Pitchfork. Oh. think of any pretty words. Not then, anyway. I let her figure it all out for herself, and she was still at it when we got to police headquarters where we told the whole story to homicide from start to finish. And finally, when a coroner's crew went up to Vista Point to take Satlin Ring to the morgue and a gaunt police secretary with calluses on her mind hammered out the reports, I went over to Beverly, the little country girl, who was looking through a dingy window at the dingy backyard of a city. Are they going to ask any more questions, Mr. Marlowe? No new ones. They've got it all. They just like to repeat to be sure it comes out the same each time. You can't blame them, you know. <laughs> well, they're not going to hold you. You can leave tomorrow and go home. Yes, I know, but I, I'm not going back. I'm going to stay here in Los Angeles. Be sure, baby. It's a big place, lots of people. Awful lot of people. Not if you think about them one at a time. Yeah. Uh, say, Marlowe. You can go now if you want. But we'd like to talk to you again, Miss Chesson. Will you come in, please? Oh, yes, sir. Well, good night, Phil. Can I call you one of these days? You better. Starting tomorrow. Smiled. <laughs> and the freckles on her nose all ran together. Yeah, it was a lovely sight, that nose. I watched her walk into the lieutenant's office, and then I went out, got in my car, and headed home. And as I drove, I thought about Hepcats, Hicks, and Hayseeds. But as she suggested, one at a time. You know what? It worked. That way, there's no difference. They're all people. Yeah, I had a hunch I was going to be planning on that phone call tomorrow. Remember, friends, to make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. There's lots of cooling, real mint flavor in every stick. And chewing Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, wherever you go, keep some healthful, refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. To make every day more enjoyable... Treat yourself often to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The 
Adventures of Philip Marlowe, presented by Wrigley's Spearmint Gum, bring you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and star, Gerald Moore. Philip Marlowe is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Sammy Hill, Peter Leeds, Wally Mayer, Hugh Thomas, Anthony Barrett, Vivi Janice, and Harry Bartell. Special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's adventures of Philip Marlowe and that you're enjoying Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. We invite you to be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time I spent the night in an ancient Spanish castle with an overworked count guarding a tomb. A caretaker with blood on his mind and a seven-footer called Peter the Cruel, which was one thing. The other was worse. They all lived in the 16th century. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Hello, mystery lovers. I'm Jennifer Moss, author of Town Red, the first in a series of mysteries with a metaphysical twist. Town Red has received critical acclaim and all five stars from avid mystery readers just like you. Town Red and the rest of my books are available in print and in ebook on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and iTunes. For more information, visit my website, jennifermoss.com. You're listening to the great detectives of old time radio. Welcome back. The Marlowe pattern of leaving the murderer alone to work mischief uh, does continue in this story, but there are a couple things I really like. Uh, there's that that very decent moral tone to Marlowe through the story about the killer uh, essentially playing with uh, this rural girl's heart. And I think that's wonderful. I also love the conclusion. Uh, a very thoughtful and profound thought to go out on. And then we have Wally Mayer, um, who, of course, uh, at this point is uh, playing uh, Michael Shane, but most of his roles... Um, or character roles, and he does a very good job as the blackmailed criminal. Uh, really, uh, just turns in a very solid performance. And you can see why he was so in demand. And probably part of the reason why he got so many of these character roles rather than uh, more regular ongoing roles as he did in Shane was that there was just this, um, it, these issues with his health that made it hard for him to be predictably, um, available. But as always, he's very good. And uh, we get a lot to enjoy, a lot of Wally Mayer, even in those programs in which he's not starring. All right, well, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Nick Carter, and then be with us again next Wednesday for another episode of Philip Marlowe. In the meantime, do send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio.